Hey everyone, this is Daniel here with another episode of Founders Live. Today I have Zach from Iris Nova. Zach, how are you? Doing well, thanks. How are you? Good, man. Good. As I said, it's a uh, it's a you know little holiday here for at least some of our team, uh, but we still keep the show running. <laughs> how about you? Where are you calling in from today? I'm in uh, New York right now. Um, I'm actually this is our last week in. We have a. Uh, a distribution center that we've grown on, uh, grown out of uh, in New York City. And uh, yeah, so we're just transitioning out of it. So um, fortunately, it's very quiet here. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in New York right now. That's great. No, I'm, I'm itching to, to be able to visit New York again soon. I used to be able there, you know, probably every other month or two. <laughs> and it seems uh, like things are opening up there in the city. So New York is back alive. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's getting there. It's going to take some time. But it's uh, it's definitely better than it was, uh, you know, a few months back and um, certainly better than it was this time last year. So, yeah, no, I can I can imagine. Well, you know, speaking speaking of cities, I, I was doing some research of of of, uh, of you leading up to this. And I always find these conversations are most interesting. when We start at the very, very beginning. And uh it says on Wikipedia, you grew up in a city called Leo Minster, Massachusetts. <laughs> Can you tell me a bit more about what that was like? What that city was like? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was born in Leominster and then I grew up in Fitchburg, which is like right next door. Um, yeah, grew up in a very, uh, so that part of Massachusetts, it's um, old, uh, old mill town, um, very heavily, uh, uh, you know, like a lot of uh, immigrants, uh, first generation Americans came to, uh, you know, came to that part of Massachusetts. And um, so half Italian, half French, uh, actually, with a lot of family up in Canada, uh, in Quebec. And um, yeah, I grew up there. Um, pretty normal childhood. You know, yeah, um, definitely different than uh, I think the way kids grow up now, which is probably the same mm -hmm. for you as well. It's like, you know, no cell phones. We used to mm -hmm. just ride our bikes all summer and uh, yeah, and try to stay out of trouble. I remember my yeah. mom used to ring. She used to ring a bell when it was time for dinner, and if we were <laughs> if we were close enough to hear it, then um, then we hey. came home for dinner. But um, but that just goes to uh, <laughs> maybe that dates me a bit. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Times of times have changed. I think I have three kids, and they're um, the way that. I think that, you know, there's a little, obviously a lot of similarities, but um, technology has changed a lot, you know. Yeah, well, now you can put the air tags on their belts and stuff. They could just see where yeah. they are on a map. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, and, uh, and one thing I'm so curious about is, it, you know, as I look at your career, when I look kind of would just look at your LinkedIn profile, I was like, wow, this guy's being an entrepreneur his whole career. Um, when you were growing up, was that part of your upbringing was that were your parents starting businesses did you have side hustles growing up what was you know was that a part of your life at all uh, at a young age not really to be honest I mean my dad was a pharmacist my mom was a stay-at-home mom um, my dad uh, kind of dabbled in like business ventures he had a, a restaurant when I was a kid when I was just uh, a baby and um and then ended up kind of playing like more of an ownership role in several pharmacies in, in uh, Massachusetts. And, um, but yeah, no, I, you know, I think I, for whatever reason, I was always drawn to uh, just the creative side of business from a young age. Um, I remember when, uh, when I was in uh, middle school, uh, one of uh, my teachers uh, had a, uh, a project for us and it was it was to start your own business and which was I thought was really uh it was like basically come up with a with with a business and then present it uh, to the class That's cool and we um uh it was uh myself and two of my best friends from that time and we came up with a video a 3d video game system called xlo 3d and um <laughs> i remember you, you had to have uh you know we, we the way we came up with it you had to have three classes and all this stuff and it was very ahead of its time. Um, very cool. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I, and then I, I kind of just always dabbled in uh, just ideas, like just writing down ideas on paper and like thinking through how to, uh, uh, yeah, how to launch them. And it really wasn't until, um, I'm sure we'll get to this, but I was in the Coast Guard for four years after high school, never went to like traditional college right after high school. 
uh, and then started my first business um, a few years or a couple of years out of the Coast Guard. But yeah, it wasn't until then that I had a real operating business. Um, and uh, yeah, that was it. I mean, uh, but otherwise, like in high school, worked at restaurants and uh, actually my first job was at an egg farm picking chicken eggs, wow. which was, uh, yeah, which I think every, every young child should have a really bad job when they first start because it makes you... <laughs> appreciate uh the value of work so i could imagine well that's uh it's, i've never been on a on a chicken farm which is sounds like uh something i maybe should or shouldn't add to my my list of life experiences you're not you're not you're not missing anything <laughs> chicken farm is a glorified uh term what they really are just massive buildings full of chickens and um you walk through the building and there's a specific area where the chickens lay eggs and you just basically fill up crates with eggs and you know that was that so <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's interesting it's the the this this thought of always kind of jotting down ideas and seeing ideas that's one thing at least when i was reading a little bit about little duck and and then redwood it's it's uh you're you're always not short of of ideas <laughs> so it seems like that's a, a skill you've honed from from a very young age um but before we jump into that you sorry go ahead no, no, that was it. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, I, I, yeah it's been something that I've always, uh, I've always had a passion for, and just really trying to like think about. Uh, I don't know. It's just a great creative exercise for brain to be always uh, to be, um, yeah, just to be uh, mm -hmm. thinking, just like thinking about uh, ideas. Yeah. So. Did you have a when, when you were when you came up with that video game uh, idea? Did you did you have a favorite game you were playing when when you were that age, uh, like a console or like a uh, I mean, we used to play, yeah, I mean, we were playing like Super Nintendo all the time and N64 and, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know if there was like something specific, but it was always, I don't know, video games, I think were like a part of my, yeah, they were definitely a part of my childhood and, uh, yeah, and I think that there's, uh, yeah, it was just like a, it was like an exciting, I think what I really loved about like that type of, uh, you know, that. Like just just the whole idea of like kind of immersing yourself in another, uh, you know, in, in like an alternate reality was really interesting to me, and um, and like the narrative that came along with that. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, that was that didn't go anywhere, obviously. And <laughs> consoles really consoles really haven't changed that much. But yeah, yeah, yeah no, I was a huge uh, probably. I I I really played out my Super Smash Bros. on my N sixty four. That was the <laughs> oh yeah. Logged many, many, many hours on on that game, um, which is ironically still a uh, a very popular game. Yeah, yeah. Well, they still have competitive. Who'd have thought? If now you yeah, can make yeah. money competing in tournaments. Uh, <laughs> right, right. We were we were just a bit too early to, to convince yeah, our parents yeah, that this exactly. is a viable career path. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, so you you know through you end up at taking a, a degree in marine engineering. How does that? How did that come to be? What were you considering something else like that's uh, um, so far it didn't sound like that was a, you know, an area of interest growing up, but maybe it was, and we, we haven't talked about it yet. Uh, well, so that came uh, post uh, joining the Coast Guard. So I knew mm. a guy uh, in high school that was like a family friend who ended up joining the Coast Guard, which was kind of my um, interest. I didn't know much about the Coast Guard or the military before then. And um, he ended up uh, going to Alaska to be a rescue swimmer. And I thought that that was really cool. Um, That's cool. So uh, his name was Jason, I believe. I can't remember now. But I remember speaking with him and he had been out of boot camp and I was still in high school. And he was like, yeah, it's so cool. We, you know, we're doing a lot of interesting stuff. And I just figured that was like, uh, it was something that I was interested in pursuing. Um, so ended up going into boot camp right out of uh, high school and mm. um, and it really changed my life. And I think the way that I, uh, or the, like the things that I learned from that experience really ended up um, uh, just having like a tremendous impact on my perspective on just the world. Um, mm -hmm. So we were doing uh, uh, drug interdiction and migrant interdiction in uh, primarily in Central and South America and um, yeah, it just really changed everything for me. And it really made me realize how lucky we are, uh, as, uh, Americans or as, you know, mm -hmm. for anyone who's living in, uh, a community where you, uh, 
you know, have the freedom to do really whatever you want every day. Um, yeah, it's just, it, it, it's very eye opening to see the opposite side of that. And what we were, we were doing is, you know, you see this kind of happening right now at the border and I totally understand it, you know, like, you know, people sending their kids, you know, over to the U S and, you know, everyone's trying to make a better life for their, their families. And the, we have children, um, or you, when you have a family, I think, you know, the, the lengths that you'll go to make sure that they're taken care of, um, are, uh, you know, it's really whatever you need to do. And, um, and I, I don't think I ever saw that before. I mean, I didn't have an extravagant upbringing, but I was, we were always very comfortable. There was always food on the table and, um, mm -hmm. I really didn't need anything. Um, but when I saw the other side of that, uh, with, uh, you know, people that didn't have, uh, near as much as, you know, uh, what I had growing up, um, it just really changes your perspective and it really makes mm -hmm. you realize how lucky we are, uh, you know, to be mm -hmm. in a place where we can, um, where we can build businesses and we can, you know, take vacations whenever we want to, to other countries and, you know, all that stuff. So, yeah. Do, do you remember what your, what the first overseas assignment was? Like what, what that first day was when you left the U S borders and you landed somewhere else? Yeah. So I was in, so going back to marine engineering, I was, uh, the way it works in the military is you kind of start off as a generalist and, um, mm -hmm. you either work as what we call a fireman or a seaman in the, um, in the coast guard and the Navy anyway. And mm -hmm. basically, uh, you get assigned to a ship or, a you know, station somewhere and you just work as like a deckhand. Um, and so I chose to, uh, focus on engineering, which was um, interesting to me because I like taking things apart. And um, so I did that and then went to school through the Coast Guard for marine engineering and then ended up uh, uh, getting assigned down in Mississippi. Um, so there's small stretch of land in Mississippi that's on the ocean. And from there, we would go down to Central and South America. And I don't remember what, uh, what, which country we went to first, but we were in... Um, you know, we spent a lot of time in Colombia, Belize, Panama, Costa Rica, like really like all over the place down in mostly Central America. Um, and uh, yeah, I spent a lot of time in Haiti, uh, in the Dominican Republic. Um, yeah. And yeah, and uh, and then ended up, uh, you know, kind of finishing off my four years in the Coast Guard down in Mississippi and then ended up moving back to, to Massachusetts. But um mm -hmm. I also learned, I also realized through that, that the, you know, the, the structure and I've never worked in a big company before, but we work with a lot of big companies now. And I see what I assume to be the same frustrations that I would have if I was working in a big company where it just always felt limiting. Um, you know, even like progressing within the military, you have to take a test and then basically you get on the list and then as people retire or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, fall out of positions, that's when you kind of like, you know, work your way up. There's no real clear path to um, kind of uh, paving your own way, so to speak. And that was always, it just felt really limiting to me, even though I, I enjoyed the experience. It just wasn't mm -hmm. something that I knew I was going to be doing for, for a long time. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, I, I got out of the Coast Guard and ended up going back to school for finance um, just at nighttime. At that time, I had uh, one daughter and soon, uh, shortly after that, two daughters. And, um, and then, uh, just kind of, um, I'm, I'm getting ahead here, but went, mm -hmm. uh, applied for a job, uh, where I was, um, it was for an industrial design job and mm -hmm. really had no experience, uh, as an industrial designer at all. Um, but, um, you know, the, the company said, well, do you know how to use, uh, SolidWorks? And I said, well, yeah, sure. I could, fi uh, I could figure it out. Okay. I had never used it before. <laughs> so I ended up taking a, a class of like, I ended up getting hired for that job, uh, took a class and learned SolidWorks and then ended up working with SolidWorks for a few years before I started Little Duck. But it was, um, yeah, it was a very, uh, 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 yeah, I mean, that was, uh, mm -hmm. that was my progression from engineering to what ended up be becoming uh, business, which was, mm -hmm. um you know, it was always like, it was always very professional, uh, like learning about something. And then, um, and then eventually I was able to, yeah, start Little Duck. 
So yeah, and and and, and you know, getting there in a moment to, to Little Duck. One thing I, I didn't want to lose was you had mentioned there there are some foundational things you took away from U.S. Coast Guard that you still you know using in your everyday. Are there any memorable kind of stories or, or moments or, or kind of elements of the structure? Something that that sticks out to you as like, hey, this is something that you know, I really took from from that. I mean, years. I think just learning to be comfortable in situations or to be content in situations that are uncomfortable is really important for any entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, and that obviously takes a lot of time and you have to go through a lot to kind of get to a place where that, you know, it's easier said than done. But you know, like when I was on a ship with 50 or 60 guys and girls and um, yeah, we just, you know, it was, it's not very comfortable. I mean, we were living in like, a, a, I was living in a room with probably 20 other guys. We were on three, uh, three high bunk beds, like all the way down the length of a, you know, wow. a, like a, a small space. And then there were a couple of those other spaces on the boat. And, um, yeah, you just learn a lot about yourself, uh, when, and you learn a lot about how, how to, uh, you know, engage with people that you probably would never, um, you know, you would never maybe cross paths with. Um, also, like I was from, I'm from New England and being down even in Mississippi, I had never experienced the South before. I, I think it's, uh, mm. you know, traveling to other places and really like learning about other cultures, even within the U.S. is really important. And um, yeah, so it was like, it, it was stuff like that. I mean, there was really nothing. It also just taught me the, the value of hard work. I mean, um, yeah, it's like, you know, you don't get paid a lot to be in the military and you are, um, yeah. And, um, it, you know, it, you have to, um, you have to accept the, um, I guess the, uh, it really breaks you down. I guess maybe that's the best way to, that's the best way to describe it. Um, it breaks you down and it like makes you feel, um, uh, it makes you feel, uh, not great for a period. And then you start to like hone a skill and then you actually provide value to whatever, uh, you know, whatever the thing is that you're, that you're doing or contributing to. And I think that that is like a really interesting process and it, and it all really like correlates really nicely back to entrepreneurship mm -hmm. because, um, like this is, these are things that entrepreneurs, uh, face all the time. And, um, like starting a business is really hard. It's not easy and you have to be uncomfortable, um, before yeah. like, you know, I think that the whole startup space has become like you know, very cluttered and there's a lot of brands and there's a lot of people and a lot of entrepreneurs that are starting companies for the first time think it's going to be really easy. And I think it's a very, um, you know, uh, you get hit with that like brick wall that is reality really quickly. Um, yeah. and, uh, yeah, and I think that you, a lot of the same things happen in um, in in the military. So, and I'm sure it happens yeah. in other real world situations too. But that's my that's my context that kind of helped yeah. prepare me for starting a business. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you tasted the I guess I would I would almost categorize this as the 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 emotional parts of the most difficultly emotional parts. You had some experiences of that back then that. Uh, you know, at least to give you a, a sense of how to deal with yourself. That's the hardest part as a founder that I always found too. It's just like, how do you manage your own brain, your own emotions, your own, you know, yeah. present state uh, in, in whatever crazy stuff you have to deal with. Um, yeah, absolutely. But, uh, but so you, interesting enough, so you start Little Duck Organics when you have, uh, I think it's three kids at the time, or it sounds like two kids. And, I had and two like, kids at the time and then had three shortly after that. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, I mean, basically the story is I was uh, doing this industrial design work and then just to um, generate some extra money on the side, ended up picking up some like small consulting projects. And mm -hmm. so I started um, a uh, like a just a small consultancy and then joined my local chamber of commerce, which um, I mm -hmm. feel like chamber of commerce is are kind of like extinct at this point. But um, <laughs> and then they had like breakfasts every month or whatever. And, um, yeah, and I, uh, went to one of these things and a woman that was there, uh, you know, I think I, if I remember correctly, like everyone went around and kind of like said what they did. Mm -hmm. Um, I said, you know, I'm a product designer. I, um, I design products and, uh, mm -hmm. she was like, well, I have a cookie company. And, um, she said, 
I don't remember the exact situation now, but it was like, you know, I have a cookie company and um, we sell our products in Whole Foods and all this stuff. And, um, you know, my cookie box needs, I need a little bit more room in my cookie box to add more cookies. Hmm. And um, at the time I was doing like, uh, uh, like design work with like sheet metal and stuff like that, but we were doing the same type of stuff. So I was like, oh, it's easy. We'll just adjust the dial line and we can work with the manufacturer or whatever. And um, so that's what I did. And that's what kind of opened my eyes to, um, to the world of food and um, ended up, you know, kind of parlaying that experience into, well, maybe I could just start a food company because it was Mm -hmm. something that was really interesting to me because I think what was cool about it is that, you know, I was creating, uh, you know, in my, like industrial design world, like we were creating assemblies, we would make, you know, maybe 20, 30, 40 of them. You know, with food company, with food products, when you create a product, um, you replicate it, you know, millions of times, you know, across yeah. all these different stores. So, you know, the same product that a consumer is experiencing in California is the same product that's in Florida or Massachusetts or whatever it may be. So that was really interesting to me. And so I started kind of playing around with, um, with what it would take to, to launch a food brand. And at the time, my kids were eating a lot of snacks, and um, and I thought that. Do you have kids? No, I don't have kids. Oh. But uh... yeah. So, anyways, kids eat a lot of food, and um, yeah, I can imagine. I remember myself as a kid, so. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I uh, you know, I thought it would be really interesting to. Oops, sorry, my light, my monitor. Um, no I thought it would be really interesting to, uh, to uh, do, you know, in organic food products were just starting to come up at the time. Um, so I wanted to create an organic line of kids fruit snacks that were made only of fruit. So I ended up finding a, f- a freeze dried manufacturer and creating packaging and all this stuff and really just kind of like knew nothing about the industry and, and really just made it all work. And then just by chance ended up meeting a guy who was like, yeah, I think I can get you into whole foods. Um, this is in 2008. He's like, you know, if I can do it for you, uh, do you think, like, can you give me like 500 bucks? And I was like, yeah, sure. That's great. (laughs) And at the the time that was a lot of your deal ever. (laughs) Well, at the time, I mean, yeah, it's crazy to think, but 2008, which was what, uh, 13 years ago, um, Mm -hmm. or 14 years ago. Um, it, you know, there weren't many food entrepreneurs back then. And, Mm -hmm. um, starting a food company was still really, really kind of like obscure. And, I remember starting Little Duck and then I was like, well, where can I talk to other startup people? And I ended up going to these meetups at MIT where it was all tech founders. And I was like the only food guy there. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it was still pretty rare to have, uh, to be starting a food company. And, um, yeah, but I did that and, um, I learned a lot. Like I remember maxing out, um, a credit card at the, at the time, um, like the, my first run of packaging, I didn't even know anything about raising money or anything like that. And my first run of packaging was um, like probably ten or fifteen thousand dollars. I can't remember. And I I found this packaging supplier by going onto Alibaba and then like meeting, like basically having these like late night phone calls with uh, with this packaging supplier over in China. And you know, it was we we got to the point where it was ready to put in, you know, the, kind of that initial order. And, um, I was like, well, I don't have $15,000, but I had, um, credit at the time. Um, and, uh, I remember I wrote myself a check from, you know, how credit card companies, well, I don't know if they do this anymore, but they give you like, you know, checks. And, um, so I wrote myself a check, I deposit it into my bank account. And then I ended up wiring the money to, uh, (laughs) to China, which was a huge bet. And especially with a young family and everything else. And, um, yeah, and it worked out. So we built that brand over several years, learned a ton of stuff in a lot of different stores. And then I ended up selling it to a private equity group um, mm-hmm. in 2013. And um, yeah, just like learned so much through that experience about just how to uh, yeah, how to build something, how to manage people. Um, I mean, yeah. What, what was the, what gave you the confidence even at, at that point to drop Fifteen thousand dollars to, I mean, especially back then, Alibaba is not the company is today. I imagine that's a stressful thing to just have this money kind of disappear. It's like, well, fingers crossed that even what I ordered shows up. Never mind 
this business actually, you know, become something. Right. I think I had just a, I had a lot of conviction around my responsibility as a father and building and having some, and being in control of, of the, uh, the future of the people that I was responsible for, which were my children. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just didn't, uh, I, I knew I wasn't happy kind of having the, uh, my future kind of dictated by, uh, something that was out of my control, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. so, you know, it was, I guess my mind state at the time was like, well, I'm going to do this and I'm just going to have to make it work. Um, and I think, yeah, I would think I was thinking, well, I I don't know. I mean, I guess I was thinking like, if worse comes to worse, this doesn't work out and I'm out, I need to work to pay back 15 grand, but, um, at least I could say I did it. You know, I still remember where I remember everything about, I I feel like my brain is, uh, you know, I, I have selective memory at this point, just because, you know, uh, I've done a lot and I've like, you know, you don't, you don't think about everything through uh, the lens of like where you were in that moment in, in a mental state, you know, unless you're making mm-hmm. like really big, big life decisions. But I still remember everything about, I, it was late at night. I was in, in my, uh, in my like home office, in my basement and I remember everything about like that room and everything and making that decision mm-hmm. to do that because it was like really such a critical thing. And you know, a lot of what we end like the progress that we like, I don't know. I, I think this is a good, it's a really good lesson for entrepreneurs because it's like, sometimes you just need to do, do things. I think I learned later on in my career that you, know, you can make those decisions and if they don't work out, obviously it's really uncomfortable and you need to, um, you need to, co- you know, correct course. Um, And it's really important to also know when something doesn't work out so you can like, you know, correct course sooner than later, because I think a lot of entrepreneurs like, you know, Mm -hmm. I I, I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs now, they've been working five, 10 years on a business that clearly just isn't working. um, And they continue to just invest time and money and energy and everything into it. And it's like, it's okay to just say like, hey, it didn't work out, like move on to the next thing, you know? Um, And yeah, I mean, fortunately for me, not like it did work out fine, but um, it could have easily not. And uh, either way, I'm still glad that I made that decision mm-hmm. because it ended up kind of um, forcing me into a situation where I, uh, you know, we, we ended up growing the company. Which is great. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the decisions really are, are just, you know, access information, right? You decide, you you know, it's it's payment of does this work? And if it doesn't work, at least, you know, now opposed to never pulling the trigger and you'll never know. <laughs> and right. uh and that happens in you know macro ways in terms of like do I start this or not, and then everyday micro ways of. <laughs> Sorry, hold on one second. I, um, no worries. I'm doing this on my phone. Sorry, this is real world. I for some reason I I need to shut off my. Can you see me now? Yeah, I can see you fine. Okay, I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to turn. Sorry, just give me two seconds. I'm really sorry. Yeah, I'm going to actually just switch. I just want anyone to call again because I'm doing this on my phone. And um, Oh, yeah, yeah. Camera, the... <laughs> and I just don't want it to. So I'm going to switch over to Wi-Fi and then I'm going to shut off my So Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. Give everyone a moment. As we're waiting for Zach, Andy, thank you so much for... Uh dropping in your comments we have uh, some local uh, fitchburg love here for anyone who's watching the stream we got a, a fun episode for you guys on wednesday as well so if you enjoy what you're saying please i encourage you to like and share what's going on and uh um you know it does a lot to to keep these stories uh propagating on the world of, of linkedin and elsewhere so thank you all guys for tuning in also at the bottom i think you should be able to see you should be able to actually at the top right if I remember the screen, you should be able to see where you can follow us too. So um, you can give it a like and a, and a follow. This lets me live out my my dreams as an esports streamer here on LinkedIn. <laughs> Zach will jump back in in, in a couple of moments. Um, but yeah, please, if you guys have any questions for anyone that's watching, I please encourage you to uh, to drop them in. I see Greg. Um, Greg, thank you. So Greg, we're interviewing Zach Normandon today. Welcome back. 
I'm back. I'm really sorry. I no, should have done that. Good, I should have done that earlier. So, anyways, we can, jump, we can jump back into it. So, anyways, that was my experience with um with Little Duck, and it was a uh, was a definitely a, a great learning experience, and really paved the way for kind of a lot of what we're doing now with Iris Nova. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, so so you 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 built the business. I mean, uh, one more question I'd love to ask on that um, before we kind of jump to Redwood and Iris Nova. Whole Foods is obviously the big customer you land, but who was the first person that bought the cereal? Uh, well, I guess it was it was it was a retail play at that point. There's no D to C. There's no you know what you end up pioneering now with texting. None of that existed back in <laughs> uh, when you started the business. Right. Who who was the first person that gave you a purchase order for for the product? So this is a good story. So I I remember I was um, so I didn't know how to sell products into stores. So I just basically um, went to like Google search looked up everywhere I thought would sell my, that would potentially sell the product. So I created a big spreadsheet with like probably 200 different stores. And I created a like sample kit, which was basically one of each of the products that we sold with like a line sheet and a letter from me saying, mm -hmm. um, Hey, I would love to sell my product there. This is, you know, this is the product basically I sent it out to 200 accounts. Uh, all in New England for the most part. Um, and I ended up getting one store that uh, that called me back. And I remember I was at a wedding in Florida and I got a phone call and the woman said, um, is this Little Duck Organics? And I said, uh, yes, it is. And she said, uh, well, I'm from Philbrook's Fresh Market in New Hampshire and uh, we'd like to order your product. And so... At this time, I didn't. We didn't even really do a full production run. This was like pre pre production that I sent all these samples out because my idea was, well, I'm going to get people to buy it, and then I'm going to produce the product, and then we're going to, you know, sell it, and then we're going to be able to support the stores. Mm -hmm. And, um, anyways, that basically ended up kind of uh, that was enough. Just that one store where I was like, okay, we got to make the product now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was that was the first customer and. Uh, yeah. And they're not, unfortunately, no longer around. They were um, kind of a victim of COVID, but it was, um, hmm. it was a very, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was great to, to finally see that product on shelves. Um, and then, you know, obviously afterwards when we ended up getting into more, more stores, um, yeah, it really just kind of uh, like, that's the best feeling ever to see your product on store shelves. And um, I think, you know, with that comes a lot of other challenges and like maintaining shelf store, you know, shelf presence and everything else. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think one thing that I was always really challenged by in that process was that, you know, the, the, uh, the control of, of that decision always lied in the buyer of the store, not in the customer. Yeah. So the customer, yeah. um, was really kind of like an afterthought of, of that process. And, you know, uh, unless you were selling through Amazon or whatever else. So it was always, um, something that I was trying to sort out is like, okay, how do we, um, how do we bypass that? And how do we really get closer to the consumer? And, um, we did that and we had a direct consumer business on our own website and it, it grew really nicely, but it was still always something that I always felt, uh, I always felt kind of, uh, uh, limited by, uh, our ability to have to get the approval from, um, mm -hmm. you know, from a store buyer before we could actually sell yeah. to consumers. Um, and also once that happened, we didn't even know who the customer really was. So, um, yeah, they just, so I think ordered that, that, another case and that's your only proxy. Like, I guess they ordered another case. So this, this must be working. We don't know why I can't, unless you stand right. in the store and talk to people, you know, taking it off the shelf. That's the only way you'd know. Right. Exactly. So, um, so yeah, and that ended up shaping a lot of my, like reflection on that experience shaped a lot of uh, my thesis for Dirty Lemon and for Iris Nova. Mm -hmm. And and so there's this little bridge period between selling Little Duck and 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 uh, Dirty Lemon starting where, um, it, it, again, this is just from when I'm reading. It seems like this is this period where you got to indulge in like all the crazy concepts and ideas as it relates to the product side. Of uh, like, right. uh, I read about uh, ice cream container that changed color uh obviously with with little duck you had the, you're ahead of your time on plant-based packaging or biodegradable packaging uh yeah, yeah. you know w was there anything um maybe, maybe just touch briefly on what redwood was and was there a project that 
whether it was successful or not that you enjoyed working on the most in that era or that time? Um, so after I sold the company, I, um, I ended up taking like probably a year off or so. And I had a lot of, I've always been like a package design guy. That's been my, um, like really thinking about how the consumer interacts with actual physical product is really something that I've, I've always been really interested in. And, and um, I've always dissolved our packaging, uh, both for little duck and for dirty lemon and we, we have a lot of, we have a brand group now where we do some of that work as well. Um, mm -hmm. So package design has always been my, I, I would say passion. Uh, and, and really kind of like thinking about the intangible things that draw a consumer to, to purchase and repurchase a product, you know, in the future. Um, so I, um, you know, after the, after the, I saw the company, I had a lot of people reaching out to me just with that. Um, you know, they were looking to improve their packaging and, um, mm -hmm. and that's, that's really kind of like how Redwood started. And really the, you know, Redwood was, uh, was kind of the lab that we used to incubate, uh, three lemon as well. Um, mm -hmm. we ended up doing a lot of package work and then we also ended up working with a lot of production facilities. And so I was kind of doing, I, I was like all over the world, really, it went to, um, to Europe and to to uh to asia to all these different places to work on different uh food product you know food packaging and then and then thinking about how the manufacturing can play into the packaging to create a unique product and um and i was really interested in uh at the time i mean i've always been fascinated by the beverage space but i was really interested in um you know all these ingredients that you know it was primarily juice shops were adding to their drinks mm -hmm. to kind of like give them more value and charcoal was one of them. So mm -hmm. we ended up, um, through a connection I had testing out some, you know, a bunch of different, uh, different, uh, ingredients inside of what was basically a really simple base of, of lemon juice and some other stuff. Um, and that's, that was really the genesis of dirty lemon. And then, um, mm -hmm. yeah. And then the rest is, the rest is history, but the, <laughs> the way that we sold dirty lemon is really what made it, what made it mm -hmm. really special and still, um, is a, 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 a core part of the brand, but now we have a lot of other brands that we um, have, we're utilizing that same technology with. So, mm -hmm. well, I, I think this is an interesting jumping off point to, to Iris Nova and what you've built and, and, and one kind of trend on this, uh, I guess, as I looked at all the different innovations you, you thought about or tried to create or even sketched out up until Iris Nova, I felt like a lot of the work was done on what are new product concepts, new product packaging. And, and this was, now on the other end of let's actually just not that the product itself didn't have its differentiator but it was on distribution it's on how you buy mm -hmm. it's on a I and mean, i'd love to understand the supply chain of how you built such a you know next day shipping supply chain so early in the company and that's like a a part i don't think uh a lot of people realize how difficult really is but w what shifted in your head of like no it's no longer just the product but i'm gonna actually put all my time and effort and money into fixing or innovating on distribution? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it was just going back to Little Duck in the, in the issues or the challenges that we, that I was facing a uh, founder in, in reaching consumers. Um, but was also just like really trying to think outside the box. It was like, if I'm going to do something else in food, I really want to do it differently and figure out how it can be um, not the same as everything else that's out there. And you know, I think one thing that was I was really fascinated by was um, what was happening within the payments, within uh, payment and communication platforms that were, uh, or sorry, that it was happening within messaging apps specifically, um, but they were also being used as payment platforms. Hmm. So if you look at like Line or WeChat or uh, even WhatsApp in some places, um, you know, they're being used as payment gateways as well. And that's that's where my mind was like, okay, well, mm. you know, we don't use those same apps as our primary form of communication in the US, but we use SMS and SMS is an open protocol. So you can, you know, uh, uh, you know, you can build something that truly is almost open source uh, mm. over SMS instead of having to be restricted by, um, by the, you know, the tech infrastructure of an app. And, and so started really thinking through that and then actually going back to, this is a crazy story. So going back to when I was 
hanging out at these MIT meetups, I met all these mm-hmm. tech guys and then ended up building a relationship with, you know, several of them. And um, when I had this idea, I was like, listen, I want to try to actually authorize a credit card transaction over text message without having to use anything else. I went to a guy and I wrote up a scope for it, uh, a guy mm-hmm. that I um, that I built a relationship with. And I said, you know, do you think you could build this for me? And he did. And that was really the V1 of the, um, wow. of the platform. And then we ended up, you know, subsequent to that, we've evolved it dramatically over time. But, um, but yeah, the original thing was just like, okay, have an idea and then take a risk on it. And it was relatively low. I mean, the, the platform was so basic when we first started. Um, we actually couldn't even see, we couldn't even talk to customers. It was just, uh, it was just that mechanism for actually, uh, you know, completing the transaction. Uh, um, so you just get their payment information, you now, know where to ship it and that's, that's about it. And then do it again next exactly. time they come by. <laughs> and it was all bought, it was all, it was all bought, bought based. So, you know, some have to type order and then it would come back with an automated message. How many mm-hmm. cases would you like one? And then we use that and then their credit card would get processed, but it worked. And we grew the yeah. company quite a bit for years. And then that attracted Coca-Cola. We ended up um, partnering with Coca-Cola and, um, yeah. And now, uh, you know, and, and when Coke came into the company that we transitioned from, uh, a focus, uh, exclusively on dirty lemon to building out, um, you know, the same suite of product uh, of, um, uh, uh, tech tools for other third-party brands, which is what we, mm-hmm. uh, what we have now. And, and, and again, I, this is only snippets from other interviews. So, uh, you can correct the, whatever <laughs> journal article I was reading, but I, I was very fascinated by this one comment you had made hinting at like what your, your view of billion dollar brands will be in the future. Uh, you know, it's really the, the, you know, consumer tastes are always changing, always rapidly evolving, and, uh, and I think, you know, building brands in the future will be very different. And, and I'm just curious to get your thoughts live here on, on what you see that world turning into in the next, you know, five, 10 years. Well, I, I mean, I don't think there are any billion dollar brands as startups being built right now, um, or that are, you know, there are, there are brands that have been around for a while that will, mm-hmm. that may likely be billion dollar brands in the future. Um, and maybe those brands aren't owned by Coke or Pepsi. Um, in the beverage space or just a broader CPG space, the winners in in CPG are going to be the incumbents. They have mm-hmm. the capital, they have the infrastructure, they have the solution, they have everything. They just need to learn to be more creative and, mm-hmm. and more creative in the way that they're connecting with consumers and the way that they're, um, you know, th- their speed to market, all these things. But there's, you know, it, it, it's becoming increasingly more challenging to uh to break into the market product and um i don't know i like in the cpg space almost to like etsy now um Mm -hmm. you know there's the barriers to entry are so low to create a new product um you know with 10 15 20 thousand dollars you can create a new product Mm -hmm. and um and that is a challenge. It's like, you know, it, that means that anyone who has an idea can bring up a, a product to market. But what, what, it, what it represents from a challenge standpoint, the most is like, there are, there are going to be fewer and fewer viable exit opportunities for CPG brands, because there's just too many, there's too many things. And consumers are also becoming conditioned to jump around from brand to brand, because there's no, there's no, no switching costs, um, there's no, uh, well, I mean, they're just like, there's, there's so many options that there's, there's, there's uh, they naturally want to try new products and, and there's no reason to stick with a specific brand when there's always like a newer, better thing that's coming out, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, I think that that mm-hmm. is something that uh, is, uh, is just going to be really challenging. So I don't think that billion dollar brands are being um, like, I don't think the next Coca-Cola or the next, Gatorade or the next vitamin water or whatever is being built right now. I think that they likely will be built, but it's going to be within the larger uh, CPG Mm -hmm. companies because, um, because it's, it requires, there's too much capital required to build a brand in this market and it's really hard to do it profitably. And I think that all those things just make, um, even if you have a ton of revenue, um, you know, it, 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 it makes it uh, hard to justify, 
the multiples that have been historically applied to CPG brands. And there's really not that many. That's the other thing that's crazy is like the, the hundreds <laughs> yeah. of brands that are launched every year, you know, I can count on two hands how many companies have have sold for a, a, a great multiple over the time that I've been in the space. There's just not any of them. And when investors wake up to that and when the legacy strategics realize that it's not a good spend of money to buy startups, they should be doing internally. They're going to realize that they should just be hiring the best entrepreneurs to create products and learn how to revise their internal process to be more uh, conducive to current market conditions. That's where yeah. I think that's where the industry is headed, not just in beverage, in uh, snacks, oh. beauty, personal care, I think it, all those categories. So. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. It, there's, there's a few different kind of uh, similar trends I, I've seen, and you can just read reports about it as well. It's, I feel like in entertainment, it's the same, you know, similar kind of story of there's never going to be another Seinfeld on, you know, cable TV because there's a million different types of content. It's so easy to become a content creator. You have so many options. Um, and, and in product, you're right. It's, uh, it's you as a, even if the well, most well capitalized entrepreneur cannot beat out a, uh, you know, a Procter and Gamble or a Unilever who has capital and who has supply no, and who has distribution and has cost advantage. And it's, right. uh, it's really an uphill battle. Um, but it, you know, one thing that I do see yeah. is consistent for those who, who are, are maybe not aspiring to build a billion dollar brand, but want to create a product for their own livelihood is can you just build the brand profitably? And I think that's one consistent trend I'm seeing now where venture dollars. Bingo. And, and, yeah. <laughs> No, I was, just, I was gonna say yeah, that, yeah. like that's it. That's the name in the game. If you can't do it profitably, it's 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 honestly better just to shut down the company. Um, I'm, yeah, it's funny. I've been before I jumped on. I was I'm, I'm writing a investor update right now to our investors, and it's like it's the only thing that matters. It, you have to do it profitably because, um, yeah. I mean, our goal our goal as a company is to generate a million dollars in in revenue for every full time employee. Um, and I want to do that profitably and yeah. that, um, uh, you know, that, that's, that's the, that's the goal. And to, you know, we need to, uh, we're not, uh, that's the ultimate gauge of success. And if we don't, if we don't hit that, I don't think that we actually can or have the right to compete in this current market because there's, there's, you know, there's not a lot of opportunity outside of that. But once you, once you do achieve profitability as anyone who's done that, well, no, you have full control over, you know, over mm -hmm. uh, what you can do in the future. So, yeah, well, it's, it's the, uh, I always just tell our own team, it's once you're profitable, you have infinite life. You go from, you know, every day dying a little bit as you burn through your cash to immediately, as long as you right. can sustain it, I can be around for as long as I want. Uh, and that's, uh, right. you know, it's a nice feeling to have that control. And that, uh, even though it's stressful, by all means, it's at least a bit more calming. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so as as we're as we're coming up on time, I I, I know obviously Irish Nova is, is is an exciting business that you're you're building, and, and so whether you talk about that or, or just personally for you, what 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 is exciting for you in the next you know the back half of the year? What uh, what you know what are you uh, you know Jones up to to spend time on or or do or learn or <laughs> play around with whatever comes to mind? Yeah, I mean we're doing less learning now and more just like reacting to things that we've we've learned instead of like really kind of testing um so mm -hmm. uh yeah at the beginning of this year we um we opened the platform to to brands outside of the beverage space um so we have about 30 brands right now that we're managing currently and um probably another 20 or 30 brands that are in various states of of um like finalizing their contract with us um so we're really excited to just continue to um to expand our reach with the platform and we've we've learned much over the last two years really since since we transitioned to a SaaS platform um it like just we we had never run a business like this before and also there's a lot of factors you know as, as a result of uh covid that have really changed a lot of things and we've had to do our best to react to those things as fast as possible. Um, I do think that we're in a place right now where um, we really can scale exponentially. We really weren't there before for a variety of reasons, but a lot of it was just the way that we, like the way that we were building the brand, the business was, was um, not, uh, it was not conducive to uh, 
like scaled growth. It was conducive to like hyper focus on one, like, you know, a very small number of brands rather than a lot of brands. And so that's what we're, we're focused on right now. And then um, on the brand services side of the business, we have um, ownership stakes in uh, four brands right now. And that um, is really interesting to me because we're able to um, leverage that ownership to, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, really focus on, um, uh, on just uh, building profitable brands from day one. And we advocate always for, is the lowest number of employees that you um, can possibly have and really being profitable on a per unit basis with every product that's sold. And um, Mm -hmm. so we're, I'm excited by that because it, you know, it takes the focus out of, um, you know, how it it takes focus for the brand owner out of how do we sell this thing and more into like, well, how much money can we make every year, which is a much better, (laughs) not money as in revenue, but money as in profit. Yeah. Uh, like I would much rather have, um, I would much rather have uh, an asset that generated a million dollars in profit every year than sell a company that's unprofitable for fifty million dollars. Um, I mean, maybe that's the wrong number, fifty million. But you know what I mean. Like I, I would prefer something that generates consistent profit year over year rather than put all of my eggs into someone eventually buying something that mm-hmm. potentially won't happen. So, yeah. um, so we're we're focused on those on those two areas uh, and. Yeah, really strengthen our strengthening our relationship with Coca Cola. Um, I I really love the team at Coke, and I I think that there's a lot more that we could be doing with them. And then just really kind of opening our scope to be potentially working with other strategics too, because I think everyone is focused on how do we how do we reach the consumer at where they live. Uh, you know, it used to be how do you get to consumers. Um, you know, uh, wherever they are. And in those places were much, uh, there was a much larger number of those places before COVID. Mm-hmm. Now people are just spending a lot more time at home. And I think that that is, um, a channel that we've really, um, we've, we've spent a lot of time developing. And I think that there's mm-hmm. a lot that we could be doing to work with larger strategics to, um, help them learn how to best serve customers in that place. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that that's going to be a, uh, and would this be, I guess, outside of beverage? Because what you're doing can really apply to all different kinds of products as you eventually grow the platform, right? Yeah, I mean, we're not we're not exclusive to beverage by any means, um, and yeah, the technology. You know, our our vision was always when you're on your last bottle or can of your favorite beverage, but that could be, you know, uh, any product, you know, really that you're using when you're on your last whatever that is you should be able to pull out your phone, text that brand and say, send me more of this product. And then <laughs> that's it. You know, not have to worry about anything yeah. else. And so we look at the phone number as as almost like the domain name of the future. Um, mm-hmm. I think that in the future, brands are going to, uh, you know, have uh, a website where they showcase their products. But I do think that ordering is going to happen um, directly from the brand. And it's not going to happen through a traditional shopping cart even though we offer that with all of our brands, it's just, I think that there's going to be a more direct way to access brands to, to um, have access to the products that you purchase on a regular basis. And with that, um, you know, we have, we have customers for dirty lemon that have been buying dirty lemon since 2015 and they have, you know, four or five, $6,000 lifetime values because they've been buying for that. And that's really, really wow. interesting to look at the history of a customer from the point that, you know, they first buying the brand, you can, there's so much data you can gather from that. And that's, you know, mm-hmm. I think for any big, uh, any, any brand, uh, having access to that data really gives you much more control over how you're building your business. hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, I think we, we, we can close it off there of, uh, if, you know, my, my key takeaway here as, as you're building all the trends I'm seeing is, you know, build something profitable, uh, and, 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 uh, you know, focus all your time and effort there. And if you do that, hopefully you'll have the freedom to, to do whatever you want with your life and your business. So Zach, I really appreciate you taking the Absolutely. time to, to chat. Thank you so much. Of course. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Well, everyone and watching. listen, Thanks by the way, I love, mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, I Go love ahead. what you guys do as yeah. well. We've, we've used clear bank for a long time. I think we've taken uh, a, a, a sizable amount of capital from you guys. And I, I think what you guys are doing is, uh, uh, is a tremendous value to your community. And I really, um, you know, I, 
I think before we started working with you, I didn't, um, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's wonderful. And I'm sure we could spend a whole nother segment on just this, but I think really what you guys have built is, um, is, uh, is tremendously valuable because the value of, uh, of cash is really important as you're building a business mm -hmm. and being able to have access, um, you know, to capital quickly without, without it diluting the company is really, really important. Um, so I think it's amazing what you guys do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and for any entrepreneurs that are listening, I would highly recommend Clearco now, which I, uh, in my head, it's still clear bank, but um, same in mine. Yeah. We're I, trying, I think, we're trying our best to learn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yeah, I just wanted to throw that, that in. So much. I really, really appreciate it. that means so much. And, and, and you know, I, when I was reading about Little Duck, when I think about, you know, my business 10 years ago, I wish this thing existed back then. And uh, I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, you, you wish there was something similar other than raising all that money uh, back in the day. Uh, so uh, thank you. Thank you yeah. for being, uh, you know, part of our portfolio and for, you know, building uh, what continues to be an amazing innovation for, for now beverage entrepreneurs and product entrepreneurs and, you know, it's uh, you're 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 having equal impact in changing the industry for so many people too. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Have, Have a great, great rest of your day. Of course. Thanks everyone for tuning in. I'll see you guys later. Bye bye.